Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. It's always difficult with this passage, the day before Lent starts, by the way, Lent starts tomorrow, that this gospel passage in particular from Matthew chapter 6 always has so much to unpack. Today starts the initial step towards passion, towards the resurrection of our Lord. Um, the gospel today reminds us with our weapons that we have during this time, these disciplines of prayer and fasting and almsgiving. Each of the weeks that come from now uh, remind us of the fact that we are in war, war against sin and war against evil and temptation. Oftentimes the battlegrounds are not external. No, they're internal. They're within ourselves. And we fight the demons who try to arouse the passions within us. And we see these three pillars that will guide us through this time, giving and prayer and fasting. I want to speak about fasting because I think it's safe to say that the practice and the idea of fasting, I think, is largely misunderstood. Sometimes it's even ignored. Others dismiss fasting as something that's old-fashioned, something that's naive, something that's simple. And they would say something like, you know, those rules that the church has made were made for the past, for much simpler days. But I think the importance of fasting depends on its meaning. Many of the fathers have written on fasting, among them St. Basil. And St. Basil said, one of the most inspired comments when it comes to fasting. He says something simply. St. Basil tells us that fasting is not abstaining from food only. It is, first of all, abstaining from sin. Abstaining from sin. So then the question is, why bother fasting with vegan foods? Is it really that important? We know that there has to be a balance kept between the outward and the inward. On the outward level, fasting involves a physical abstinence. There should be a time in the day where we physically don't eat. It shouldn't be the first thing that we do is break our fast with some coffee. So, but the rules about eating and drinking should never be treated as an end in themselves. At the same time, I think we should never overemphasize these rules about food. We shouldn't treat them as outdated either. Sometimes we live in the extreme. We think that we overemphasize the rules and then we think that they're outdated and we live in the extremes. St. John Chrysostom said that the fast is abstinence not only from food, but from sins, echoing the thoughts of St. Basil. The fast should be kept not by the mouth alone, but also by the eye, the ear, the feet, the hands, and all members of the body. So, in other words, don't make fasting a diet starting tomorrow. Starting tomorrow. Don't make fasting a diet. Prayer and fasting and almsgiving are, are the central pillars of this Lenten season. But fasting by itself is not helpful. I'm going to say that one more time because that might be bold for an Orthodox priest to say that out loud. Fasting by itself is not helpful. In fact, it could be harmful. If our fast is not accompanied with prayer and scripture and worship, then it's just a diet. And worse than that, if we fast for spiritual reasons, just by removing something from our life is not helpful unless we're filling it with something else. Nature does not like a vacuum. So the devil will come and try to fill any space that's left unattended in any aspect of our lives, away from prayer, away from the sacraments, away from confession, away from acts of compassion and charity, then our fasting becomes a diet. Fasting has no value when, it has, when it's not combined with prayer. So in the Gospels, the devil is, is not cast out by fasting alone, but by prayer and fasting. We remember this passage. We'll come to this passage in a little bit. Prayer and fasting, in turn, should be joined by almsgiving, the, the, the love of others expressed in a practical way. And this could be done not only by feeding the homeless in, in, the, in the tough streets, but it could be acts of service at home. We're stuck at home. We have to find ways to imagine how we can give 
our love in a very practical way at home. And this comes with acts of compassion, but also acts of forgiveness. We have to be able to, uh, to forgive each other. So it's not a diet. In Orthodox Christianity, the fast that's given to us by the church, by the fathers and mothers of the church, are not from foods that are bad for us. They're not evil foods. The church goes straight to the heart, though. They go to the essential staple foods of life, meat and dairy products. The church goes to the heart because if we can master the fast of these essential foods, then it's more likely that we will be able to master self-denial with many other things in life. Fasting helps us to sweep and to empty and to put in order our soul. But if it remains empty, then we're leaving ourselves open to even worse problems. Why? Because without fasting, without prayer and fasting and scripture and worship, sometimes fasting is seen as prideful. It's self-centered. And it alienates us from God instead of drawing us closer to God. Another point in fasting is that it's not optional. It's not optional. Fasting is an example given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ and a command of God. It's a command of God, just like he commanded Adam and Eve in the fast to garden, uh, in the Garden of Eden. He said, in, in, God said in chapter 1 of Genesis, And the Lord God commanded man, You shall freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you shall eat of it, you shall die. You shall not eat. It is a command to fast. One of our most basic appetites in humanity is the hunger for food. We need to eat and drink to live. This is obvious. But in the gospel reading, Christ instructs his disciples about how, how, how to fast. He begins by saying, when you fast, he doesn't begin to say, if you fast, there's a big difference. So the assumption is that we will fast. In other words, it's not optional. And if we accept our calling to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow Christ, then we have to follow in his footsteps and practice fasting. With fasting, the church is not asking us to starve ourselves. She is offering us instruction on what foods to stay away from because they tend to arouse within us passions like anger and lust and greed. And the church is also offering us guidelines to eat smaller amounts, not luxurious things, so that we can be hungry as Christ was hungry when he fasted. This feeling or the sensation of hunger can become a protection for us. It can awaken our hunger for God. And it makes us aware of our need for God. In the gospel today, it also says that it should be done in secret. It should be done in secret. This draws us closer to God. Regarding fasting, our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us that it must be done in secret. In other words, fasting must be done in humility. Not to impress people. I, not that I only fast when I'm with certain people, certain family members, just for an appearance. No, it is done to draw us back and closer to God who sees our humble efforts in secret and tries to and rewards us openly. So our prayer and fasting is an expression of our return to the Lord. It's, a, it's an expression of repentance. So we have to ask ourselves, are we taking advantage of these essential tools of prayer and fasting, especially during the Lenten time? Think about this time last year. We were shutting down. It was, it was getting, the news was getting very bleak about the coronavirus. This was at the, in the middle of Lent. So what happened to our Lenten season last year? We have a time, we have an advantage to, this is the beauty of the church, the cyclic beauty of the church, is that maybe we made mistakes last year. We got really caught up with the news of what's happening with corona. And we forgot that we have a responsibility and a blessing to, to act on these on, on our fasting. Maybe the fasting went to the wayside because we were so 
anxious to get anything from the empty shelves of the, of the grocery store. We have to ask ourselves, are we letting time pass us by? In our world today, the message is that you don't necessarily need to fast in order to become holy. You don't have to fast to become righteous. You don't have to fast to, be, to help the poor. You don't have to do that to help the afflicted or the hungry. No, you can just keep eating and consuming and taking in as much as possible. And you can still all do all those like righteous things. But the reality is it doesn't work that way. You can't keep consuming and consuming and expect that we have the same time to give. It doesn't work that way. St. John Chrysostom warns us of being a hypocrite when it comes to fasting. He says, It is possible for one who fasts not to be rewarded for his fasting. How? When indeed we abstain from foods, but we do not abstain from iniquities. When we do not eat meat, but we gnaw to pieces the homes of the poor. When we do not become drunkards with wine, but we become drunkards with evil pleasures. When we abstain from all the day, but all the night we spend with unchastened shows. Then, what is the benefit of this abstination of foods? When on the one hand you deprive your body of a selected food, but on the other you offer yourself unlawful food. We have to be careful of the hypocritical fast. But there's multiple reasons and benefits to fast. Number one is obedience. We don't have that many opportunities to practice obedience in our adult lives. Obedience. The church tells us to abstain from certain foods, specific foods, certain times of the day, hamburgers and, and fish and all that kind of stuff. The point is not about what you like and what you don't like. The point is to obey. It's a big blessing. It's a spiritual exercise. Another reason for the fast is spiritual exercise. It's a big benefit. It's so that our body learns how to obey our minds instead of the other way around. We are not to be slaves of the body. Our body is to obey our mind, and our mind is to obey the direction of the Holy Spirit. That's how it works. There is nothing evil about eating a hamburger. It's just when your body wants a hamburger and we tell our body no, we're performing a spiritual exercise. It's sort of like weightlifting. The more exercise, the stronger you get. That's the way when our body wants to sin, when we have greater strength to tell our body no against sin, because we've been exercising spiritually, we need this. It's good to tell your body no every once in a while. It's good to tell your body no when it wants to eat something delicious. Whether that food is actually made of meat or dairy products or totally vegan, and you tell your body no because it's just it's too appetizing. It just looks too good. That's a good fast. So another benefit of the fast is to overcome problems in our lives. This may seem like a stretch, but have you ever felt like there was a problem that just didn't go away? Or if you feel like you have one problem to the next, one problem to the next, and it just keeps coming, it just keeps coming relentlessly. Most of us do. And if you don't, you're very blessed. And I, I don't want to rock the boat there. But I think most of us are fighting against problems in our lives. And these problems can be brought by many different ways. Most of the time, it's our own fault. I'm going to be, I'm guilty of that. Fasting is an important tool to overcome our problems in our lives, especially when the problems are caused by the battle against and the attack of demons. Now, some of us feel like, and they'll say, I don't, I don't feel like I have demons around me. But that's, that's an illusion. The reality is the devil exists. The demons and the legion that follow him exist. This is a reality. And so the commitment that they have is to pull as many people away from God as possible. That's the reality. So helping is... So fasting is helping us become aware of the spiritual warfare, and it's used as a weapon in the warfare. Our Lord said, only by prayer and fasting. So is there something in your life? I want you to reflect as we enter Lent. Is there something in your life, whether it's 
freedom for particular sin, whether it's a relationship, whether it's something that is going on between you and your spouse, something with your kids, and you've tried praying, and you've tried praying and praying, but have you tried fasting and praying? Have you ever tried a period of time where you go without food entirely and have nothing but water and you pour out your heart to God in prayer? There are certain times that when you fast and you pray that God hears you from heaven. Think about the disciples that our Lord gave the power to perform miracles and to cast out demons. He gave them this authority. He gave them this power. And yet there was one child that was tormented by a demon from his early youth. And the disciples couldn't do anything about it. Do we know this passage? I said I was going to come back to it. This is from Matthew chapter 17. And the apostle said to our Lord, why couldn't we do it? You gave us the authority, but why couldn't we do it? And our Lord said, this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. So there are some works of the devil, according to Christ, that we pull from this passage, which you cannot fight by prayer alone. In other words, it's not enough. You can pray and pray and pray. Even you are an apostle, of an apostle and, a, and the demon will not let go. But if you fast and pray, you do a warfare on a spiritual level and you can defeat the enemy. And the devil runs, he flees. Fasting wasn't given to us so that God can kind of just cross his arms looking down at humanity and frown and say, ha, see what I'm doing to you guys, what I'm making you guys go through? Sometimes we have this image, it's too strict. The church is too strict. And God says, you're going to do that because I said so. No, this is far from the truth. Yes, God does require it of us. It's a command. He does require this from us. But is he just being hard on us? Is he just kind of messing with us? Is it to give us some tough rules so that we have to sweat through life, difficult and, and struggling always? Do we always have to struggle in the church? No, God wants you to be free. God wants you to be free. He wants you to be free from every deception of the devil. He wants you to be free from every demon. There are some demons that will only let you go through fasting and prayer. It's not the hardness of God. It's the mercy of God. It's the goodness of God. It's the love of God that requires you at least one time out of the year, if that, to focus on doing that very thing that makes the demons go. It's such an incredible power. It's such an incredible power, fasting and praying, that can make the demons flee. It can make the demons flee in cases where the apostles were helpless. We couldn't do it. Isn't that a good God? Isn't that good of God to require it of us that there are some times in our lives where we are required to fast and pray? It's not hardness. It's not meanness. It's saying that we have a reality. We are living in a battle against the enemy. And we're talking about higher stakes. We're talking about an enemy that wants nothing but eternal damnation for each one of us. Those are the stakes. So the church assigns times of fasting and prayer. And by the way, this could be done in June. It could be done in January. It could be done any time of the year. It doesn't have to be anywhere close to Lent. It could be in the middle of the summer where you fast and pray. So you can fast and pray on your own. But throughout the year, you need, we need practice. And God assigns time for us to put off food to the side so it's not the priority. And we make it secondary so that our physical bodies, um, uh, the needs of the physical body are put secondary. No matter how far or how long we've been a Christian, sometimes we tend to fall asleep and we fall into dreamland that's around us and we forget about the reality that's around us. And so 
Our stomach is not here to control our minds and our thoughts. Our mind and our thoughts are here to control our body. So we need to trust him as a good and loving father. We need to recognize that he does not that he does this because he loves us and he's trying to heal us. And through doing this, he puts us in a position that our prayers have greater power. And this is something that we thank him for. We should be joyful. This is what the gospel says today. That we should be joyful and we thankful that our Lord has given us the opportunity for Lent. This wise discipline of fasting means a, a, a redirecting of ourselves to draw closer to him for repentance. So to conclude, fasting along with prayer and worship and giving during this time of the year leads us to reflect on how we should live our, our lives in our relationship with God. To commit to a life of faith. So the practice of fasting is important to remember that we are not fasting simply for the sake of fasting. Fasting is not to be superficial. It's not supposed to be um, all-consuming so that we're fixated on and design methods of how we can have loopholes and experience the luxurious foods without breaking the rules. No matter how strict our fast in accordance to the technical rules that the church has given us, it's useless if we're not committed to prayer and to worship and to giving and to study and to in our growth in our in our in our faith. And charitable acts. Fasting is not the goal. Fasting is not God. Fasting is not God. But fasting, along with prayer, are essential, indispensable tools for us to express our repentance, and our mourning of our sins. So I should add, lastly, sorry if this is going a little bit longer, but fasting for many of us can take years of practice, years of practice for an effective fast. I, I believe in myself, I have a long way to go in this area when it comes to a true fast. We may fall, we may fall numerous times from the ideal that I've tried to sketch out here. And this is the tactic of the devil. What God wants from us is the struggle, truly the struggle. He wants us to prepare the way of the Lord in our own hearts, within ourselves. All we need to be doing is being faithful in our struggle. And he will meet us where we are. Fasting is an offering. Offer what you can. Be be faithful and honest in your offering. Do the best that you can. Seek guidance from your spiritual father. Ask yourself often whether you are on the right path. In this way, your fasting and your struggles will bear much fruit. And glory be to God forever. Amen.